today we tend to take it for granted living indoors at a comfortable even temperature. In winter especially, central heating has really changed our lives quite dramatically. Without it, people had to spend hours carting coal about, lighting fires, keeping fires going, and they still had to wear masses of clothes indoors. But to make a heating system that's completely automatic and reliable has taken an enormous amount of effort and ingenuity. I hope to tell you something about how these systems evolved and how they work in this program. Even lighting a simple fire isn't at all easy without modern gadgets like lighters or matches. One of the most effective methods used in many parts of the world is the bow drill. It's much better than the Boy Scout method of rubbing sticks together. But even this requires a lot of skill and practice, and I haven't managed to make it work myself, despite spending a whole afternoon playing with it. Even speeding up the rotation with an electric drill. The friction is creating a hot powdery charcoal, which in theory can make a bit of tinder catch light. This looks much more hopeful, but I've never actually managed to get a flame out of it, despite trying all sorts of different types of tinder. Well, the ancient civilizations, including the Romans, very sensibly never let their fires go out if they could possibly help it. At first, the Romans simply had a fire in the middle of their living room. The Latin for hearth is focus. The fire was literally the focus of the room. But they probably had trouble with smoke, as the Latin for living room is atrium, from atta meaning black. So they started putting the fire outside in a furnace, with cavities under the floors and in the walls. But the Romans were rather decadent, and just as they were getting comfortable, their civilization declined and fell, and houses once again became very smoky. The next attempt to improve matters was made by the Normans. They made holes in their castle walls and tried to funnel the smoke out sideways. Here we've built a horizontal chimney, and you can see it doesn't really work very well. gases from a fire naturally rise and so to make a chimney draw it really has to point upwards. The Normans finally realized this in the 13th century when castles started to incorporate true chimneys. By the 18th century chimneys were regarded as indispensable in Britain and hardly any buildings were put up without them. Even Chiswick House, which was intended to be an exact replica of an Italian design by Palladio. At the last minute, the design was modified to include four large chimneys on each side. Lord Burlington had the house built after returning from the grand tour of Europe fired with an enthusiasm for Palladian architecture. But he obviously felt that comfort was more important than aesthetics. Although well-designed open fires made houses almost comfortable, this sort of heat was totally unsuitable for the tropical greenhouses that came into fashion in the 18th century. An even heat was required for the plants that was totally smoke-free. At first, the Roman system of central heating was revived. The only remains are these cast-iron chimneys disguised as urns. Fires were lit behind the greenhouse and the smoke was drawn up through cavities in the wall. The wall became hot and this created the warmth the plants needed. The 18th century was also the start of the Industrial Revolution and steam power was really the miracle of the age. So all the fires behind the walls were soon replaced by a central boiler and uh, steam or hot water was fed through these enormous pipes that acted as radiators 
In fact, these systems are remarkably similar to the modern domestic central heating systems. These pipes take up much more space than today's small bore pipes and ultra-thin radiators, but the principle is really exactly the same. This is a steam-powered clock I made for a health food shop a few years ago. The positions of the weights show the time, and every hour they're wound up by a steam-powered piston. It taught me a lot about the problems of using steam. One of the worst is scale. The high temperatures tend to increase the effect, and even using a water softener, scale causes all sorts of difficulties. For a start, it's very difficult to regulate. On this valve, for instance, it's a very, very slight adjustment between it not providing enough steam so the piston doesn't work at all and providing too much so it whizzes up and down at an alarming rate. It's all timed so the winding finishes exactly on the hour and the whistle blows. Steam heating remained popular in America for large buildings, but hot water systems have far fewer problems and quickly replace steam for domestic use. Commercial exploitation of central heating for private houses didn't really start until the 1920s. At first, it was only installed in luxury houses. But it quickly spread to the mass market, first being incorporated on a wide scale in the new suburban housing estates of the 1930s. Since then, many different types of central heating system have been developed, but the hot water and radiator type has remained the most common, and it's this that I'm going to concentrate on in this program. It's basically very simple. Water is heated in a boiler by a fire and the exhaust gases go up the chimney. The hot water is pumped through a series of radiators and eventually returns to the boiler to be reheated again. The pipes round the boiler do look a bit complicated. There's one pipe to a tank in the roof to fill the system with water. There's also a vent pipe which lets the water inside expand as it heats up and lets water and steam out in case it boils. Here we've deliberately overheated this system and the steam harmlessly comes out of the vent, while fresh water comes in through the feed pipe to stop the boiler boiling dry. Of course, this doesn't normally happen and the boiler is actually rather inaccurately named as the water is never intended to boil. Most boilers also provide the hot water for the house, and this creates even more pipes that we've left out on this model. Here Rex has made a transparent radiator, so you can see what happens inside. The hot water, fresh from the boiler, builds up at the top, and then as it gives out its heat, slowly falls until it goes through the outlet and back to the boiler. Although radiators are simple things, they can stop working. Air can become trapped inside, and this stops the circulation. This is why radiators have bleed valves on top. Radiators can also corrode. In this old radiator, you can see how much debris has accumulated. The corrosion insulates the water inside the radiator and reduces its efficiency at giving out heat. Modern systems usually have chemicals added to the water to reduce the corrosion. Of course, all the radiators and other bits and pieces are joined together by copper pipes. There are two common sorts of connector used to join the pipes together. This sort's called a compression fitting, and it's rather ingenious. Inside are these soft copper rings called olives. And when I tighten the uh, nuts up, this uh, squashes the olive against the pipe and makes the joint watertight. If a joint like this leaks, you can often stop it by just tightening up the nuts a bit. 
You can see the solder inside this sort of fitting. It's called a Yorkshire connector. The end of the pipes are first coated with flux. Then, when the joint is heated, the flux cleans the metal and the solder flows out and seals the joint. These fittings are cheaper than compression fittings, but if a joint like this leaks, it can be tricky because it has to be completely dry before resoldering. This is a basic solid fuel boiler. It's simply a coal fire surrounded by a jacket full of water, a sort of double bowl shape. It's designed so as much heat as possible is transferred to the water, though the top of the boiler has to be left open or the fire wouldn't draw properly. This boiler is probably only transferring about 50% of the fire's heat to the water. The other 50% is wasted up the chimney. An ingeniously simple way of heating a whole building from a single coal fire without a boiler was used in the Danish war office. Cannonballs were heated in a basement stove until red hot. They were then carried to every room and deposited glowing in the fireplaces several times a day. This was possibly the first ever coal-fired central heating system and remained in use until about 1900. Oh. Although coal was the first fuel to be used, today oil and gas-fired boilers are more common. Oil-fired boilers are a bit more complicated. This is the wall flame type, and the oil comes in right at the bottom under an electric motor. This is the shaft of the motor, and as it whizzes round and round, the centrifugal force pushes the oil outwards and upwards through these tubes, and it comes out the end as a fine spray. This spray is ignited by an electric spark. Oil-fired boilers like this tend to be less wasteful of heat than solid fuel. The water being heated sits between the double walls of the boiler, just like in the coal one. Rex uses the spark units from these boilers to create the Jacob's Ladder effect you sometimes see in films as part of Frankenstein-style laboratories. to central heating boilers. Gas was first used only for lighting, and the original gas lights were just holes in the pipes. Gas mantles weren't discovered until the 20th century. These early gas lights weren't very effective, but they were a bit brighter and less messy than candles. But then, in 1855, Professor Robert Wilhelm von Bunsen published his findings on the effects of mixing air with the gas before it was burnt. In this, his Bunsen burner, the gas comes out of a little nozzle and uh, goes up a tube. And a variable amount of air can be drawn in through the side of the tube. As the air is added, the gas burns more efficiently and the yellow colour caused by the unburnt particles of carbon disappears. With this temperature probe, you can see that this is the gas burning alone. And then when I add the air, the temperature goes up quite dramatically. I can see the tip of the probe getting red hot. And for the first time, this made it practical to use gas for heating. 
happy in the morning, cause the water's hot. We can bath an army, the ascot does the lot. Happy after breakfast, cause the water's hot. Dirty, greasy dishes are left without a blot. Cleaning house has no more fears, the ascot's waiting there. Saving money, sighs and tears, an endless wear and tear. Happy in the evening, cause we know we've got water, water everywhere, and always boiling hot. The ascot works on exactly the same principle as the modern gas central heating boiler. These sorts of boilers do look much more compact than other types, and that's because instead of a large water jacket, a small amount of water flows continuously through these pipes above the flames, getting hotter as it goes. These fins help transfer heat from the flames to the pipes. <coughs> it also all looks rather more flimsy than other sorts of boilers, but this is because gas burns with a much cleaner and less corrosive flame than anything else, and so the metal just doesn't need to be so thick. And the thinner the metal, the less energy that's wasted heating it up every time the boiler comes on. The gas comes out of this row of jets. And then it draws air into these tubes just like in the Bunsen burner, and then it burns in this array of flames. Many gas boilers have a balanced flue. This is basically just a hole in the wall, and the air comes in through this hole, goes around the outside and up through the middle of the boiler, and then the exhaust gases come out through the same hole. Unlike the Norman horizontal chimneys, this actually works because the whole unit is totally sealed and the pressure of the air coming in exactly equals or balances the pressure of the exhaust gases coming out. And that's why it's called a balanced flue. It often seems rather wasteful when you feel all the heat coming out of one of these things when the boiler's on. But uh, in fact, gas-powered boilers are really quite efficient and up to three quarters of the heat of the fire is transferred to the water. In an open fire, only a quarter of the heat may be transferred to the room and three quarters of it may be lost up the chimney. But of course you don't notice that because your chimneys are usually out of reach. The most common sort of electric central heating doesn't use boilers at all. By placing this hot brick in the cold water, you can see the energy stored in the brick. This is basically the principle behind electric night storage radiators. And this particular radiator we've cut away so you can actually see the element. And at night, the element heats up and transfers its energy into the bricks. And they charge up very, very hot indeed. And the following day, they can give out the stored heat throughout the on-peak period when electricity is a lot more expensive. Every sort of central heating system needs controls to turn it on and off according to the temperature and the time of day. Thermostats which control the temperature are really quite simple devices. They're basically bimetallic strips. This is a giant one we've made and it's steel on one side firmly fixed to brass on the other. If I heat it up the metals expand at a different rate and so the strip bends. This is the thermostat out of an actual central heating system and you can see the bimetallic strip inside and as the temperature warms up the strip will bend and make an electrical contact which turns the system off and then as the temperature falls the strip bends back and switches the system on again. Besides thermostats, central heating systems also need timers so the heating only comes on at times of day when it's needed. These are basically just clocks with a dial that goes round once a day, pushing a switch on and off as the pins pass. This one's switching it on, this one's switching it off. 
Simply moving the pins sets the switching times. Digital electronic timers, which do the same job, appeared a few years ago, but they haven't completely replaced the dial type, just as with watches. The digital ones can switch the times more precisely, but they're rather more fiddly to set. But the overall efficiency of the central heating system depends mainly on how well the house is insulated. Without insulation, about 30% is lost through the roof, 25% through the walls, 20% through the windows, 15% through ventilation, and 10% through the floors. Roof insulation is obviously the most important improvement. But double glazing is often quite effective, simply because it also stops drafts, and these can cause greater heat losses than everything else put together. Ever since the building regulations were modified in 1980, every new house that's been put up has had to be very thoroughly insulated. These houses have a timber frame. The black exterior is just a weatherproof paper on top of plywood. Inside there's the wooden framework that carries the weight of the house. To provide the insulation, a four inch thick blanket of fiberglass is stapled over the plywood. Once the insulation is in place, the interior walls are finished off with sheets of plasterboard. The outside is finished off with a fascia of bricks. These keep the house weatherproof, but don't actually carry any load. Besides the insulation, there are some other simple ways of reducing the heat losses like including porches to reduce the drafts every time the front door's opened. Some architects have also experimented with more extreme ideas, like making the windows smaller and non-opening with energy-efficient air conditioning instead. Oh, I can't see, it's too dark to read. But the small windows can make these houses rather dark and depressing, and the lack of natural ventilation can also make them rather smelly. It can also cause dampness and rot. It's easy to forget just how energy efficient old houses can be. Suffolk farmhouses, for instance. They had highly insulated roofs, thatch, and they were generally built facing south, complete with porches. They even had a sort of primitive central heating system. They were all centred round massive central chimney blocks, usually weighing more than the rest of the house put together. This acted like a giant storage radiator, so keeping just one good fire alight would warm the whole chimney block, enough to take the chill off all the adjacent rooms. People did have to wear more clothes, but at least the house was never stuffy, and next to the central fire could be quite cosy. It all did have a sort of elegant simplicity about it that a modern system lacks. But of course, modern central heating systems can heat houses to much higher and more comfortable temperatures, and they're generally automatic and avoid all the labor of keeping fires going all the time. The only problem is like all technology, it can sometimes go wrong.